tonight, I wanted to talk to you about using the gradual release of responsibility while you are teaching reading. So what the reading structure looks like when you're using this format of the gradual release of responsibility and practically what that actually looks like in your classroom. So I'm sure for many of you, you've probably heard about it. In fact, you've probably even read about it, but you might wonder exactly what that looks like each week in my room and or in your room and how we take this idea that we know is going to help our students succeed. We know it's a high yield strategy, but how do we actually use that day to day? When do we do what? How do we fit that all together? So I really wanted to break down how the gradual release of responsibility is going to look like in our classroom, specifically for reading instruction. So that's what we are looking at tonight. If you are new to teaching with Inquiry Live and this is your very first time meeting me, well, hello and thank you for joining me. My name is Patty and I am the four or five split grade teacher who's actually teaching a straight grade for the first time ever. And I am the teacher author behind madlylearning.com and the TPT store by the same name, Madly Learning. And I come live every single Monday night at 9 p.m. to talk about teaching using inquiry-based teaching strategies throughout all aspects of the curriculum. So when we're talking about gradual release of responsibility and how that relates to inquiry and inquiry-based teaching pedagogy, one of the things that I look at when I am using language-based instruction in my classroom is I'm definitely embedding some student voice and choice in there as well as following the lead of my students. So we're going to kind of see throughout as I break down each one of the four steps of the gradual release of responsibility, how inquiry-based teaching pedagogies have been mixed into that, um, that kind of form how I structure my routine. So there are four components to a gradual release of responsibility. The first is modeled, which means that the teacher is doing and the students are watching. Now that was, that just makes so much sense to me when I look at what is actually happening. When I, instead of talking about modeled reading, it's teacher do and students watch. The second step is is shared teaching, which is where the teacher is doing and the students are helping. So there's a little bit more collaboration between the teacher and the student in a shared activity, as opposed to in a modeled where the teacher's simply just showing and modeling for students what's happening. The third step is guided instruction. And this is where we begin to flip the learning over, where the students are taking more control and we are allowing them to be the ones that are the ones doing while the teacher is coaching and guiding on the side. So we still want the onus to be on the students to be doing most of the work and the teacher to be helping. Now, specifically in guided instruction, you're looking at small group learning most typically and then we move on to our fourth category of the gradual release of responsibility, which is independent work. And this is where we have finally moved our students where they need less of our assistance and they're beginning to do something independently. Now, this is the goal because this is where we can evaluate students is through their independent work. So we're not evaluating their ability to read when we're doing a modeled reading activity. And we're not even evaluating students when they're a shared reading. We won't be taking assessment data, but we're not evaluating them. When we get to a guided level instruction where the students are doing more and independent, that's where our evaluative pieces come in. So we really want to move students from the teacher doing all the work to the students just watching to the students doing things independently so that we can actually collect some evaluative data on our students. So what do all of these components look like in our classroom when we're teaching 
reading. So the first is modeled reading. So modeled reading is typically when a teacher is going to pick a text and they are going to read that text for their students and make their thinking really explicit. So you're going to choose, say, a picture book or a novel, and you're going to read that to your students, probably not all at once, but short bits. And while you're doing that, you're going to be modeling what it is that you're thinking inside your head. So as you're reading a part of the text, that might prompt you to be asking questions or making connections or looking at analyzing point of view or author's purpose. You might be determining whether something is just important or whether it's just simply interesting. All of those things are happening when good readers read. And for a lot of our students, they just do this naturally. But for some of our students, they actually need to be explicitly taught how to think about the text they're reading or they need to be aware that their brain's actually doing this and the confirmation that they are actually doing the right thing when this is happening. We want to make sure that our students are thinking as they're reading. Also by reading to our students frequently, we are modeling for them what good reading sounds like, what good reading looks like. We're modeling appropriate fluency and decoding strategies as we are reading so that they can hear what good fluent readers look like and sound like when they're reading. All of these things are good, especially for the students who have struggled perhaps with reading, as well as for students who are still on that journey of learning how to read. So if you're looking at early junior students, they're still learning how to read. So showing them what a good reader does when they read and making kind of the keys to being a good reader, making that really obvious and explicit and labeling those things for students is really important. So one of the things I do before teaching when I'm before I'm planning out my modeled read is I choose a book that I'm going to read to my students. So this is often going to be either a novel or a picture book. And I generally will lean towards picture books. And the reason for this is because I can read so many more picture books in a year to my grade fours and grade fives than I can a novel. And with that picture support, students really, that allows that kind of bridging between a primary and then moving into junior grades where students can still use some of the picture clues to help them predict and ask questions about things that are happening in the text. Not a necessity, and we should be moving students away from some of that in their own independent reading, but it's still great to support them. It also allows me to choose a variety of different text forms that I can cover throughout the year because I'm reading a different book every single week. So once you've picked your book, before you're even teaching it, before you begin reading it with your class, I like to preview that that and I reread it, I read it before I'm going to teach it with my students and I grab a pile of sticky notes and as I'm reading, I record my thoughts about things that I'm reading. Now I try not to stick to specific comprehension strategies. I've really moved away at one point, um, a lot of literacy leads liked to talk to teachers about teaching one comprehension strategy at a time. But in reality, good readers use all the reading strategies interchangeably. While a text might lead to one reading strategy over another, I think it's important to recognize for our students that those using making connections or inferring or predictions never happens in isolation and they happen interchangeably and often sometimes at the exact same time. So it's okay to model all of the different comprehension strategies that you are going to use. So as I'm previewing this text and I'm recording down my thoughts of predictions and connections and point of view and questions I might ask and all of the things I'm thinking would be good prompts for student discussions, I'm writing those on sticky notes and attaching them inside the book where I had those moments of thought. Once I get all of my sticky notes, I go back through and I start noticing what did I do most often? Was I making connections? Was I making inferences? Was I determining things that were important? Was I making predictions, asking lots of questions? The focus that I am spending the most time on as a reader is often what I will end up being my main focus of my read aloud when I go to teach it with my students. I still will mention the other ones, but generally there's always a dominant reading strategy that I find appropriate to each text. So that's what I will end up focusing on specifically for that text. 
So once I've done that and I have all of my little sticky notes, I do go through and edit some out because I don't want to constantly be stopping when I'm reading with students. So I do go back through and take out some that I think just aren't as rich or might not um, prompt enough thought in my students. Just because it prompted my thought doesn't mean I need to share all of my thoughts with my students. I can edit some of those out. So then during teaching, I take this read aloud and I begin reading it with students. Now I try to not structure that read aloud so that it only lasts one period. I like to stretch a read aloud out over two days because it gives me more time to have discussions about what we're reading. So as I begin reading for my students, I will stop and pause for these think alouds where I will share the things that I'm thinking with students. I may ask them a question. I may give them a break from listening to reading where they can turn and talk to a partner and discuss a question that I may have asked of them. But I will go through with the first half of the book and share those reading prompts with students that I had come up with. So the next part that I will do is I do the second day where I will finish the second half of the book and I spread it out. I'm not sure about you, but I know that my students can generally sustain about 20 minutes of really focused um, listening skills and I will generally pull them into my carpet. So they're, we're looking at about 20 minutes, not right now because it's the beginning of the year, but over the course of an entire year, I can generally expect about 20 minutes of sustained attention for the majority of my students. So I try not to read my picture books for much longer than 20 minutes at a time. So that's my model. So after reading, I will leave my picture book out because I do find that it's important for students to be able to go and pull that book for when they're doing independent reading or some bell work and they just wanna preview the text because they've read it, I've already practiced my think alouds, so they can then kind of repeat and rehearse some of the things that I did themselves. So I think it's a good idea to leave your picture book out for students to reread after you've read it to your class. So once I have my modeled reading and I've done that over two days, the next component of my teacher-directed lessons are going to be shared reading. Now for shared reading texts, I consider there to be two to three days of shared reading activity. So this is where I will pick a paired text. So I will choose a text like my read aloud and I will pick an idea or event or concept or theme that might've happened in that story. And I will choose perhaps a parallel text such as a nonfiction text that might be related to that. And I will read um, that as my shared reading. Now with shared reading, the teacher is doing but the students are helping. So I do give my students each a copy of their own text that they can either have their own copy, they can share it, or I will project a copy of the text onto my board so that students can see the text and read along with me while we're reading. Now, one of the purposes for shared reading is something that I have not always done, but something I'm really enjoying doing in the last couple of years is really looking at using the shared reading as an opportunity to teach students how to dig into their text and to really read in between the lines in a much more granular granular way that you can't necessarily do when you're doing a picture book. So I take a shorter text that we can really dig into. Sometimes that could even be the excerpt from the read aloud if I think there's one piece where we can really start looking at some text elements. So with a shared reading text, I read that text and I teach my students how to read that text in three different ways. The first time students will read the text, I think that it is important for them to simply just gather the gist of what it is they're reading. What is the general idea that's happening? What's the main idea? And what I call the gist of the story. So if you can tell me what's happened in this piece of text in 10 words or less, you've captured the gist. And that's kind of my goal for the first time students read through the text. Then I will have my students read through the text again. Now this is the second read, and this is a time where we're really looking at things like author's purpose and text elements we might dig in to text feature. 
We might look at some figurative language and language choice, but we're really looking at the words on the page and those pieces. So we're not really looking at thinking deeply about making connections and some of those comprehension reading strategies and questions that we might want to answer. That comes later. In the second read, we're really digging down into word choice, author's purpose, and really looking at the words and structure of the text itself. And that's the second. Then I will have my students read the text a third time. Now, often this could be used again for, say, a reading response. If you want them to reread it the third time and respond to it, this is a great time to weave in some, move them away from the shared and get them into some independent or even guided instruction with the same. But for myself, I like to get them to read the text the third time and together we talk about a question that the text that we could answer. So if the question we're focusing on, say for the read aloud was on asking good questions, then for the third read through the shared reading, I will walk my students through with their help about how to find an answer, a question of like, what questions were you asking yourself while you were reading? And we will go through the text and actually take highlighters to the text and highlight and extract the information out of the text that allows students to answer that question. So it's a time for students to find text evidence and actually work together with me on what that looks like so that they will then transfer that skill into their independent work when they go ahead and answer some of these comprehension reading questions that are typically asked to assess a student's ability to comprehend an independent reading text. So shared reading is where I will teach them how to do that, and independent reading and reading responding is where I will expect them to apply the things we learned in shared reading on their own. So that's shared reading. Then we move into guided reading. Now guided reading is generally for most of you going to be an expectation that every time you get to meet with students, it is effective. Small group instruction and lots of opportunity to give students really tailored quality feedback, which happens in guided instruction, small group instruction, is going to be the thing that pushes your students the furthest because you're giving them specific and targeted feedback that's for them that tells them what's the next thing they need to do. It allows you to have observe, to observe your students reading. It allows for you to have conversations with your students, which are two main components when you're using the triangulation of data for assessment and evaluation. So having the opportunity to sit with your students and actually have conversations and observe them them reading where you get to focus on six students at a time instead of 30 gives you a lot of opportunity to make notes and have conversations with those students. So it's a very valuable thing to be doing in your classroom. So when you're doing guided reading, students need sounds pretty obvious, it's reading, they should have something to read. The text should be something that's at their instructional level or in between their independent and instructional level because they're still getting assistance from you. So they're doing the work, but you are helping. So with that being said, the text doesn't necessarily have to be the exact same text for everybody at your table. It can be, especially if your focus is on talking to students about it. But sometimes what I like to end up doing is using the same text for guided reading, but allowing it to be at different reading levels. So if I'm creating the text for guided reading myself, I will use readable as a web service and I will discover what the reading level is for that text and then I will make a high and low version of that same text by altering and changing some of the word choice, sentence length, and other elements that readable identifies are complicated and affecting my overall reading. So if I have three separate levels of a text, I don't necessarily have to have the students in my reading group that are all reading the same because I have one text. It's just at three different levels of complexity. So if I'm doing, and that's kind of going a little bit more advanced, you can also just go to your book room and get a level text and group your students by reading level. And that's fine. Now, one of the things I used to think guided reading was, was we all read it together and everyone takes a turn reading. And 
You know, student A reads the first two paragraphs while all of the other students listen and follow along, and then it's student B's turn. And that's called round robin reading. I would highly discourage you from using round robin reading in your guided reading time. What's far more beneficial is getting all of your students to read at the same time, but using them in a whisper voice. So each student whisper reads their text. I will often sit at my guided reading table and I let them know that I'm doing this, but I will lean in to one student and they will begin reading. This is a great opportunity for me to listen specifically to that student's ability to decode and read the text fluently. And it's a great time for me to be taking notes because they're doing it. I'm simply just small group observing and taking notes as they're doing it. And then I will listen to student B. Student A continues reading where they were, but now it's my time to listen to student B. And I will lean in, listen to them reading, take my observational notes about their fluency and decoding, and move on down the road. And then all students will finish reading the text at their own pace. From that point, we then look at some of the comprehension strategies. We will repeat some of the shared reading expectations where we're going through the understanding the gist, getting the idea of purpose and intent, and we're looking at to thinking deeply. Depending on the needs of my students will determine what I'm actually accomplishing in guided reading, and that's going to be different for each one of my groups. And I base what I do with my groups on the previous time that I met with them, on my observations and conversations. So how well did they do on making connections? Are they struggling with understanding how to pull text evidence out of a text? Do they understand how to structure their reading responses in a way that makes sense? Do they need to add more details? Are they understanding the gist and can they summarize a text when they're reading? All of these are aspects of things that I am looking to add when the students are with me in guided reading. And I really look at what their strengths and what their next steps are going to be. And that will shape and guide what I focus on in my next guided reading lesson. Now, typically I do have an idea of what it is that I need to follow, but I may alter that depending on the needs that are in my class. So in the last video, someone mentioned, how do I fit in DR? Because I do DRA before I start guided reading. In all reality, my students are not ready at this time of year to be doing guided reading. So that means that I'm going to be taking my students in their small groups, maybe with five or six students at a time, and I'm going to be giving them their DRA assessments or CASI or whatever other prime benchmarks, what other other standardized reading assessments that you are going to be administering for your students to get you an idea of where they're starting. I will do that now instead of my guided reading. If you know your students and you know what level they're at, then you may decide to just skip doing that right now and do their DRA later on in the school year. But if you have a new group of students that you don't really know much about them as readers, then your standardized assessment-based tools are going to give you probably the most bang for your buck in terms of really getting to understand strengths and needs rather quickly for your students. So I do that first before I end up moving into students using guided reading. So I might not actually get started with guided reading where I'm selecting the text and students are sitting with a guided group. I might not actually start that traditional guided reading until November, where then I can start gathering some assessment data on different texts. But their DRA data that they're giving me is still great informative assessment materials that I can use to help form my groups and help me to evaluate um, where they are in their reading ability. So if you need to, Stop, skip doing guided reading at the beginning and instead do guided reading, but in a using DRA. So I will often do my running records with every single student all at once. So I will do running records with one student at a time until every student's running record is done. And then we do the predictions and that before reading portion all before I move on. So every student does that portion of their DRA. Then I do a blitz of like two days 
and I just get students to do the reading and finish off the written component of the rest of their DRA instead of their creative writing activities. I substitute that for their DRA booklets that they have to do. So I fit it in, I omit other things if I need to and fit that in because the assessment data is there. We're not mandated to do these things, but I choose to do them because the wealth of information I gather from these tools is worth their weight in gold. So if you're wondering, do I start guided reading now or where do I fit in DRA? It's still reading and it would be small individualized group instruction. So do it instead of doing your guided reading and start guided reading later. There is no harm in that at all. So that is the third step of the gradual release of responsibility. The fourth component of the gradual release of responsibility is to look at independent. So I look at independent reading as being, there's kind of twofold independent reading. One is the sustained silent reading that I allow my students to do as a form of bell work. And for this type of independent reading, I kind of stay out of their way. They self-select the book. They choose what it is they want to read. We talk about how we pick books and we, I want to make sure that they're picking just right books. But it's really a time for me that students get to have some ownership about what they're reading. And I try to take myself out of that equation. I try not to get too far into it or using that as a piece of evaluation. I may ask them to connect with what they're reading with something we're doing in class, but I really do try to stay out of their sustained silent reading book. However, I still need them to engage in independent activities I can evaluate to see whether or not they have learned and can apply the lessons we've learned in the model shared and guided levels of instruction and whether they can apply that independently. So my students participate in a reading response part of their centers in our classroom. And they will take either the shared reading or guided reading text that we were working with, and they will craft a response using the Oreo response opinion writing framework, where they state their opinion, they give a reason, they give an example or evidence, and then they restate their opinion. Now, the older I get in the grades, the more reasons and explanations I want my students to include in their reading response. So when they are responding to this reading and they're using the Oreo framework, they are looking at pulling evidence out. They're sharing their comprehension. So I want my students to love reading. So I stay out of their way for the independent reading and then I move on to looking at um, their reading responses. Now they will respond using that Oreo framework. I know I've said that. I hope it's kind of gotten through um, and they will respond to either the guided or the shared reading activity that we were doing in that week. And this is where I can assess students on their ability to apply the comprehension strategies to the texts they're reading. And I do often give my students a choice board for this because sometimes students don't make a connection to a text I've provided them. So I like to give them the opportunity to choose which comprehension strategy best fits the text I've given them so that they can pick and choose those questions and then with the goal of choosing a variety of questions week after week. So I don't want them to keep choosing the same question week after week, but overall I can assess on the variety of different 1.0 to 1.9 uh, comprehension expectations of the reading curriculum. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And I do have a free PDF that goes along with this. It's going to wrap up all of the three or the four levels of gradual release of responsibility into a one page PDF document. It also includes a sample schedule on what my literacy program looks like week to week. So. If you would like that, you can get your hands on that. I will drop the link in the video. You can also find the uninterrupted podcast episode, which will be posted later, later this week on all of your podcast players for Teaching with Inquiry Live. You can find that on any podcast service. Um, especially Apple iTunes, and it will be the uninterrupted version as it's been edited together, as well as it will be put on YouTube, and I will post the completed video as well there too.
Thank you so much for sticking with me. And I, I hope you have a great rest of the week and we will catch you next week where hopefully my internet will be in better quality and fixed. Thanks so much for joining me. Talk to you later.